Some people are thinkers and others are doers. I have always been the latter. I'm not sure just why, but I've never been comfortable unless I was doing something. I always felt more at home with an apron on and a spatula in hand than I ever did sitting in the living room visiting with friends. Ever since I was a little girl, my father always complimented me for being a good worker. He seemed to always notice if I cleaned the house, and he was always appreciative after I helped mother serve a good meal. Maybe it was this early appreciation, I don't really know, but for whatever reason, I carried this work ethic into adulthood. I guess it's just hard for me to sit still. I am always thinking I should be up dusting, or cleaning, or fixing dinner, or going to the market, or making plans to welcome guests. That's just me, and I'll probably never change. By now, you may have guessed from your knowledge of scripture that I am Martha, sister of Lazarus and Mary. You probably remember me as one of the few people that Jesus rebuked. Let me tell you a little bit more about that day. In fact, let me go back a little bit and tell you about what led up to that day. I suppose one of the advantages of being the kind of person I am is that I developed a reputation as a good hostess. And I hope that you don't think that I'm boasting when I say this. If you asked anyone in Bethany, they would have told you that I was the best hostess. I know this because they often told me this themselves. And yes, I was rather proud of that. You may not think it a big deal, but I really enjoyed the fact that people felt they could drop by unannounced. They would always be welcome, they would feel at home, and that they would find a good meal. And when people called me to help them with their dinners and entertaining, I always considered it a compliment. We had met Jesus several years before. We had gotten acquainted with him while he was still working with his father in the carpentry shop. We knew there was something special about him. It was as if we always knew that he had much greater things in store for him than just being a carpenter. After his baptism and after he began his public ministry, we knew that John the Baptist had been right. Jesus was the Messiah we had all waited for. Oh, I know many people did not believe it was true, but I was convinced. I had seen the miracles Jesus performed, and no one could teach like that unless God was with them. To us, though, Jesus was more than a teacher, more than a prophet, and more than the Messiah. He was our friend. On more than one occasion, he told us how comfortable he felt visiting in our home. You see, after Jesus began his ministry, he didn't have a house to come home to. He was constantly going from place to place, and our home became a kind of retreat for him. When he felt he needed rest or just to get away from everyone for a while, he would stop by. And I always like to think that I had something to do with that. If I knew he was coming, I'd try to fix up the house really special, I'd be sure to buy the kinds of things he liked to eat, and I'd make sure I had enough for his disciples too. Well, on the day that you're thinking about, Jesus arrived a day earlier than expected, so I really had to scurry to get everything in order. I wanted everything to be perfect, and I'm afraid that I became a little bit more than cross with Mary when she wouldn't help me. Instead, she sat in the other room listening to Jesus teach. You have to understand that in our day, the men were the teachers and the students. The women were supposed to be behind the scenes. Well, I told Mary to come and help me several times, and when she wouldn't, I went to Jesus and asked him if he would get her to help. I surely did not expect his answer. He said, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. One thing is needful. Mary has chosen the good portion, which shall not be taken away from her. Not only did Jesus not get Mary to help me, he chided me for not being more like her. I'll admit I was a little hurt when he first said it, but later I was able to understand what he meant. Partly, he was saying that it was good for women to learn and to know about God. But he was also saying that everyone has different gifts. 
he wasn't so much speaking against my gifts of service as he was speaking for the need to know God's will. You see, Jesus had a way of helping people feel needed regardless of what gifts they had. Even though the account that you're thinking about is probably the one you most often think of when you think of me, another event that is really far more important happened later on. You see, our brother Lazarus became sick. No one could figure out what was wrong with him. Nothing we did seemed to help him. If only Jesus were here, I thought. I had seen him cure many diseases, but he wasn't in Bethany. I asked one of our friends to go and find him and tell him about Lazarus. I knew that once Jesus understood how sick Lazarus was, he would come right away. Unfortunately, Jesus was teaching some distance away. And by the time he arrived, Lazarus had already died. In fact, we had buried him already four days earlier. We were all in the house in our time of mourning when Jesus arrived. I immediately left Mary and ran to greet him. I suppose that's just like me. When I saw Jesus, I was filled with relief at the sight of our friend, but I also felt a kind of anger that he hadn't been there when we really needed him. And so when I came near him, I blurted out, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But I know even now that whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. I don't really know what I was asking Jesus to do. I just wished he had come earlier. Jesus looked at me and said, your brother will rise again. I thought he was talking about the resurrection at the end of time. Jesus had told us about that before, and even though the Sadducees didn't believe it, I did, and I knew that Jesus was right. We would all rise from the dead at the end of time, and so I said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Then he said something that I will never forget. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asked me if I believed this. I was sure that Jesus was the Messiah, no matter what anyone else had said. And so I said, yes, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God the one who is coming into the world. Yes, I did believe Jesus was the Christ. I believed he was the Messiah, but I never would have believed what I saw next if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. Jesus asked for Mary to come. And so when I went to get her, she came and she said the same thing that I had. Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw how grief-filled we were, you could see his face change. He was overcome with compassion, and he began to cry. I know how much he loved Lazarus, almost like a brother. We walked to the tomb together, and then Jesus asked for the stone to be taken away. Now, you have to understand, we didn't know then all that we, you know now about embalming, and it was hot outside, so we knew that the odor would be terrible if they took the stone away. But Jesus insisted. Then he fell to his knees and prayed. But it was more than a prayer. It was almost like he was thanking God for answering a prayer. I didn't understand what was happening until he stood up and shouted at the top of his voice, Lazarus, come out! We all stood there, not knowing what to say or do or even think. Then, before our very eyes, Lazarus walked out of the door of the tomb, still wrapped in grave clothes. He was alive. He was alive. Jesus had given life back to Lazarus. After four days dead in the tomb, Lazarus was alive again. Jesus simply said, unbind him and let him go. 
We rushed forward to take the wrappings off. We couldn't get them off fast enough. Lazarus was stunned to say the least. We were all stunned. At first, everyone shouted and clapped their hands and they couldn't stop talking. Then everyone was so quiet. It was as though the realization of what happened started to sink in. All I know is that it was the happiest day of my life. We had Lazarus back. From that day on, how could anyone doubt that Jesus was exactly who he said he was? Unfortunately, that is not how the religious authorities saw it. Instead of rejoicing in the power of God, they saw this miracle as a direct threat and began to plot to put Jesus to death. They were afraid everyone would start following him. Little did they know how right they were. Had I known what lay ahead for Jesus, I wouldn't have even begun to pray for Lazarus to be healed. Soon, we heard that Jesus had been arrested. When we got to Jerusalem, we heard talk of crucifixion. How could anyone want such a thing? Anyone who knew Jesus knew that the only thing he ever did was love people. His whole life had begin, been given to helping people, healing people, teaching people. How could anyone talk about putting him to death? I will never forget the sight of Jesus carrying the cross through the streets of Jerusalem, nor the scene that day at Calvary. My whole world came crashing in. I wished that I was already dead so that I didn't have to see this. It was the longest Passover of my life. There was no joy in this Passover. That is, until Sunday when we began to hear reports of people seeing Jesus alive. Some wouldn't believe it until they saw it for themselves, but I believed right away. I was there when Lazarus came back from the grave. I knew it was true, and suddenly everything was all right again. If you want to remember Jesus rebuking me, that's okay. But please also remember my statement of faith. You are the Christ, the Son of God. And please, don't just remember it. Claim Jesus' promise. Claim the life that Jesus has given back to you.